Today we're going to talk about front end, back end, tech stacks, and all the other jargons that must that you must have come across. So what's front end? Well, uh, so front end in a very simple term or in a very simple definition is a part of the app or the web page that you're going to see directly or interact directly with. Okay. So if it's an app, it's essentially the app interface. If it's a web, it's a web interface. So whatever is the final, the final endpoints where which you're going to interact with is essentially the front end. And there are two parts of it. One is the design and two is the development. That is, one is how it looks and feel and two is how it works. Okay. And front end squarely consists of just three things. CSS, JavaScript and HTML. Okay. That's it. These are the three things which are the building blocks of your front end whether you're building uh, it, like whatever you're building css javascript and html are the uh, are the basis of it okay so html gives you the structure so if you're constructing a building think of html as the as the rods and the concrete that you're putting putting in which is giving the entire structure to the building CSS is how it looks. That is, how do you make it beautiful? Okay, how you make it beautiful. So all the front lawns and all the manicured lawns and uh, uh, the paints and and uh, the botany or the gardens or anything that you're putting across in turn, in, in within the building or outside of the building is the job of CSS. And JavaScript is responsible for the interactions. So button click, what will happen, uh, the, the smooth animations that happen, etc. These, these are largely all about JavaScript, okay, largely. Nowadays, a lot of these animations are also because of the SVG formats and other formats that have come across. Uh, but in a very simple, in, to give you the uh, analogy of building one, once again, JavaScript is responsible for the interactions with the building. So something like the lifts. So pressing a button, there's a lift that should go up or down. There's an escalator. Uh, maybe there is a button which automatically switches off and switches on the light, or uh, has a motion detector so it switches off or switches on the light basis the motion detected in the room. This is all the job of a JavaScript. Okay, so in an app or a website, uh, uh, JavaScript plays the role of looking after actions and interactions that the user takes, the gestures and everything. JavaScript, it's all JavaScript. Okay, uh, so let me just explain how this works using this uh, uh, graphic. So when you are loading a website, which I just explained, uh, when you're loading a website in a browser, which basically means you've entered, let's say, uh, spotify.com, right? So what happened, spotify.com, this information was sent from the browser which understands HTML, which understands the language of HTML. Okay, this, uh, so HTML is basically just nothing but a, uh, but, but a form of tags or a, a form of, uh, uh, it's a format that the browsers can understand. Okay, for the time being, you can just, you can just take that uh, to understand the flow. So browser, gets the information of spotify.com, gets the request of spotify.com, sends it to the DNS closest to uh, the user's location. The DNS looks it up and says that, okay, spotify.com points to this IP address. Browser says, thank you, and goes to that IP address. That IP address is the server. The server says that, okay, this uh, this guy looks like a actual human, so let me send, let him, let me send him spotify.com's homepage, because that's all he asked for, home page html file so that home page html file is, file is sent okay let me just show you that uh, uh, right let me just show you that in a, in a in a in a bit after i have completed this so the server send the sent the file to the user and the user receives it in the browser browser interprets it 
interprets the HTML, the CSS, JavaScript, everything that came across. And browser also understood that, okay, uh, browser as well as the website understood that, okay, this device is actually uh, a, a smaller device. That is, it's a 13 inch computer. So I need to reduce the size. It's uh, reduce the size of the images and the font and everything so that it fits in and looks beautiful on the client's website, right? So everything a user sees in the browser is a mix of HTML, CSS, and uh, JavaScript, right? This is what's happening, right? Now, this client-side scripts, that is a JavaScript, when, it, when I say client-side script, and you'll, you'll come across this term a lot. So this client-side scripts is basically JavaScript, which is being run in the browser, and it processes the request without callbacks to the server. So basically, whether it is drop down menu or it is button or anything which doesn't require any additional information to be sent from the server is processed at the client side itself. Okay. So this request is, but whenever it, let's say the user says that, okay, I want to listen to this song, it plays, clicks on the song, uh, clicks on the play button of the song, the request is sent to the internet. Okay. And this request is sent to the server which is a backend okay what is backend we'll cover that in the next slide so when the when the request is sent to the backend that is where the backend figures out that okay this song is required the song is in xyz database pulls in the pulls in the data realizes that the song is too big to be sent in one go converts it into uh, into smaller packets and sends it back as a response okay and this call is sent via JavaScript and Ajax. What's Ajax? We will cover that also very soon. But for the time being, think of Ajax as a service or as a, or as a, a special kind of JavaScript, which allows, uh, it's not even actually JavaScript, I say it's a special kind of JavaScript and XML. XML is like HTML, it's a standard, it's a, it's a structured way to uh, send information. Uh, so JavaScript and Ajax is used to send a request to the backend, uh, not all the time. So uh, Ajax is useful, like for example, when you're using your Gmail, you do not like to, uh, you would not like to see your page getting refreshed every time you click on a particular email, right? So Ajax is useful there. It allows to interact with the application without having to reload the page so whenever a new information has come to uh, whenever new information has come to uh, uh, has uh, you know has come to the, the client's end the client uh, the client browser the client uh, website should need not be refreshed it automatically it automatically adds it to the to the view so five years eight years years back ajax was nowhere actually i mean ajax was not so widely accepted or widely used it was uh, uh, it was actually gmail in 2004 which introduced it and then uh, slowly and steadily it gained a lot of prominence i, I think it, it around 2008 uh, yeah about 10 years back it started gaining strong prominence roughly right so the back end process the request it reduced pulls up all the data that was required up for the song and sends it back to the client. The client, uh, the user gets to enjoy the song without any interruption. That is the beauty of front end. Okay. So I'm, going, I'm just going to pause it here and I'm going to show you how exactly this works. Yeah. So, the next part to understand is what are the technologies that are used uh, uh, in front end. Essentially, front end consists of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and Ajax has become a very very commonplace uh, technology within front end. So, what is HTML5? Essentially, think of HTML5 as the fifth variant of HTML because as a language that was also that is also improving. It, it's getting uh, it it is getting new and new. Uh, newer and newer uh, uh, you know newer and newer uh, elements things which were uh, very difficult to do with the previous versions of html are becoming easier and so on similarly css3 is the third variant of uh, third major release of css language and finally ajax which is a, essentially a mixture of uh, javascript plus html which allows for 
you know interruption free sending the request and receiving the request if without ajax every time you have to get a new information from uh, from the server you will have to refresh the page that's the only way to do it okay ajax allows to circumvent it okay there are uh, you know there are good this uh, uh, these are all hyperlinked and I'll suggest that you please go through it uh, at your own pace on what CSS3 is versus CSS is, what's uh, HTML5, um, you know, what's JavaScript and so on. But for the time being, like I gave you an idea, JavaScript is basically, it's not Java by the way, just to, just to tell you that. JavaScript is not Java, okay. It's a, it's a, it's a amazingly uh, horrendous mistake of naming something as javascript when there's no java involved but that's how it is okay so what's backend so we understood like we saw in the previous one that backend was a magical box which uh, a magical black box which essentially served all the data all the data that our client was requesting but let's understand it's slightly deeper okay so backend is where the where all the logic of the entire app and the website is created okay that is where it is stored the actual logic okay not how it will be used and interacted with but the actual part of it so this is typically something that the user would not see and it consists of three parts it consists of server application and database okay no matter what you're talking about which so which app whatever you're talking about it will always have an application layer it will always have a server layer and a database layer so database is to store the information okay for any logical processing of request, you would need to get some information from somewhere, right? And that is the database's job. It, it's essentially uh, another computer you can think, uh, or essentially another language. The easiest database that you have been using all this while is Excel Sheets, right? And Excel Sheets are actually relational databases because there's a, there's a clear relation between the rows and columns of uh, uh, for each cell, there's a row and a column, so that's a relational database uh, because all the data points are related to each other in, in this fashion, like in a row and column. Very, I'm, I'm giving very, very crude ideas so that you just get and you understand, uh, the, uh, you get a good sense of it. Okay. So, databases are responsible for storing the information application is to, uh, responsible for processing the request so if whether the user asked for a playlist or whether the user asked for a song or whether the user asked for let's say uh, you know uh, wanted to wish list a particular song whatever the action the user did if the user is only storing it if this all of this information all of this was happening only on the front end and nothing on the back end so as soon as the user uh, uh, as soon as the user session ends the information would vanish so when the user comes back after let's say a day he would not find the wish list of song or whatever else that he did oh by the way what's a session a session is basically one uninterrupted uh, period of time where the user was interacting with some system okay now uh, if you stop for example nowadays you open multiple tabs you don't interact with them all the time right so the tab would close the session after a stipulated period of time that i think that time is about 30 minutes so for 30 minutes if nobody has interacted with the system then the session would close automatically right for you nothing will change if you come back to that tab after one hour the tab will still be there you can interact with it but a new session will start okay that's how it works so anyway, uh, so the server side software consists of all the scripts and frameworks of so when you wishlist a song or let's say you wishlist or you hearted another cat image on Instagram, that information is sent to the server, to the, to the backend. The backend server takes in that information. Server is, as the name suggests, is serving the information or it is taking in the information. Okay, so it is responsible for the requests and response of the information going from the back end okay the server took in the information that okay person a has hearted this particular image okay it is sent to the application the application says that okay this is fine because 
uh, the the person seems right and the cat image seems right the person doesn't seem to be a fraud or whatever and so this information is then sent to the database that hey uh, database please add another heart for this particular image uh, for this particular user the database says okay I'll, i've done it thank you so much application says okay thank you so much i've uh, i've received the information sends it back to the server saying that hey the this has been successfully stored tell the client this information is then sent back to via internet to the end client and that is when you see that heart image that heart white heart that shows up on an image in instagram that's when it shows up okay when this entire action has happened you double tapped on an image this information was recorded via the javascript or uh, uh, if it was a website or if it was uh, an app it was recorded via the back the the front end uh, uh, tech the front end uh, framework i'm saying front end framework because it depends on whether you're using android or you're using ios whatever it was it essentially captured the action sent it to the back end the back end said okay this is all legit this looks legit the person is not a fraud because there are a lot of robots and frauds that happen as well this is not a fraud it does whatever back end checks it was supposed to do sends it to database database records it sends it back to the application servers application server says that okay this is all look this all looks good let's send it let's tell the client that this is this has happened the server takes in the information sends it back to the client and the client sees that beautiful looking heart so you can imagine that nanosecond that the fraction of second where you see that heart this is all that happens in the back end okay now as you can imagine this entire transfer of information from your double tap to back here will take uh, will take some time right will take it can take few nanoseconds few fraction of seconds depending on how strong or how awesome the server is how good your internet speed is and so on correct and this is where the idea of sync and async services start coming in okay you must have seen a lot of times when you clicked on something for that second it shows that yeah it has recorded it um, let's say the heart has been recorded but after a few seconds you get a error message saying that hey the uh, sorry we faced some problem please try again how because as you can imagine when you're hearting something this information is going from one point to another point if it might take depending on where you are and what kind of speeds you have it might take few like it may take 0 0.3 0 0.5 seconds 0 0.8 seconds one second maybe and that is too long uh, uh, an experience it's a it's a bad experience for the front end guy right for the for the client it's a bad experience that after double tapping it has to wait for a second two seconds for the heart to show up right to get a feedback that what i did has happened and that is why a new age uh, uh, like you know technology came in which is of asynchronous services synchronous services is where you double tapped and all of these ha things happen in one go uh in sequence in a sequential manner you get the information and only then you can move ahead and asynchronous is you have given an order that hey double i want to heart this i like this and you move along and the and the uh, client that is your app or a website takes in the request and then starts processing it says that okay you go ahead and uh, uh it goes along and uh, uh, says that you go along with your browsing of Instagram and uh, let me just process this order. So in the background, in the background, it processes this information, sends it, does exactly the same thing. Okay, just that as a client, you are not bothered. You are not waiting for it to happen. On the client side, you just saw the heart. This asynchronous thing happens, comes and it is sent back to you. Uh, if all goes well, you are not informed, you are not updated or anything because you've already shown that the heart has happened, right? But if if there's a problem with that heart, if the, there was a problem for the, in that moment for to you know capture the uh, to record that heart, uh, to record that you have liked a certain photo, uh, it will keep retrying. And if after multiple tries it fails, absolutely fails, then it will send an info, uh, send an error message to you saying that hey, we tried our level best, but we could we can't do it. Please try again. 
So that is how the sync and async services work. But the fundamentals are exactly the same. Okay, the client set does an action. It is sent to the backend server. The server accepts it, understands it, sends it to the application. The application says that okay, I've understood it. Let me process it. It processes it. Maybe it uses ML, uses AI, does whatever jazz it is supposed to do. Stores the information, required information, in database, and then sends it back to the client. That's how it works. Okay. Now, what are the, some common popular servers? Servers. So you must have heard of Apache. So Apache is one of the most popular servers out there. Its only job is to essentially take in information and send back information. And for that, it ha it opens up certain. Um, uh, it opens up certain ports. You must have heard of port 80, right? Or 8080, right? Or port 22, right? So there are numerous number of ports. Think of them as gates to a, to a fort, right? Think of them as gates to a fort. And uh, each of these gates, not all the gates will be open. Otherwise, the fort will be uh, compromised, right? So certain ports are open because they are guarded heavily and there are specific protocols to follow when something comes via that particular gate and similarly the server is also responsible for opening up only specific ports for specific people for example port 80 for all incoming web traffic all public traffic has to go via this particular port nothing else okay Similarly, port 22. Port 22 is commonly used for all secure SSH uh, lines, right? So this SSH uh, is another thing I'll talk about that later, but think of it as secure communication. So the secure communication has to happen via port 22. Why? Because it has port 22 uh, gate has, uh, uh, has a certain protocol or certain things that have been uh, designed purely for secure communications, right? That is job of the server. Database stores the information. Application is application server is responsible for uh, processing all the information. So when I say application server, uh, just to just to be clear, in a large application, one single computer cannot handle all these three things because, as you can imagine, these three have different skill sets are required to do completely different things. Right. So database is supposed to store the information. So reading and writing has to be really fast application has to compute so computing power has to be really fast and server is supposed to read and write very fast and so the computer has to be optimized for read and writes very fast and that too not the kind of database uh, uh, read and writes but of a different kind of read and write correct so in a small application a small company in a small application um, a single computer for apache for uh, let's say a server let's say php language and a database of let's say mysql is okay but as, as soon as the system grows you need to have three different systems you need to have different server different computer you need to have uh, a different uh, application server whose only job is to process and compute and another server for database whose only job is to read and write okay so this is how it works some of the backend technologies that exist is PHP, Python, Ruby, C hash, that is uh, Objective C, C, Java, Erlang, all of these are backend. Okay. Now, all of these are known for different purposes. PHP was used to be one of the easiest ways to actually uh, uh, build out a backend. Uh, in fact, Facebook is designed on PHP. Python. Uh, is has grown a lot in its popularity i personally love python because of its versatility you can build up a normal website to all the way to you know creating the craziest uh, ai applications out of it ruby was uh, a hard throw for a long long time ruby was used for a lot of very interesting use cases uh, very good products c uh, and objective c and uh, c plus plus these are languages which are closer to the metal. When I say closer to metal, in the sense they're closer to the hardware. They, they, they're not as abstracted out. Okay. So ideal scenario, let me give you the abstraction idea just to just to use just let me just use this moment to explain the abstraction thought. So the abstraction of languages, uh, so this assembly language, which is essentially the last mile, like if you have to code exactly on the 
chip itself you will be using a simply language or machine language right uh, it's and it's notoriously difficult to write assembly language right and that is why people ha have attempted to write better and better and better languages so that it is easier to code it's just easier to interpret it does so that the language itself does a lot of things which uh, you know which otherwise would be too tedious or too cumbersome for the engineer right and that's why the languages started improving or they started doing a lot of heavy lifting for the for the programmer um, and that is why the languages became uh, you know easier to pronounce easier to talk about easier to say uh, they started using normal english languages english words and so on okay um, so the ideal world will be where you can simply say something and the computer automatic programs it or creates a code out of it Right, that's an ideal thing where a plain simple english is converted into uh, structured instructions which is what code is right but that is still far off and that is why you have to use one of these languages which is php python ruby and all of these vary in their abstraction and what kind of stuff they are good at right so php is good at something else python is good at something else i cannot go deeper into each one of them uh, for the moment but um, uh, understand that each of these languages have their own superpowers. Uh, Erlang was used for uh, WhatsApp, for example. Reason being, Erlang was the best language. Erlang actually originated when uh, phone switches were supposed to be created. Okay, phone switches like before mobiles and everything came in. Uh, when you were calling from point A to point B, essentially there were switches in between. There were people who were doing all the uh, connections between you know the two points. Uh, and uh, Erlang was designed for those for quick switching, and that is why it had a lot of capability to handle multiple simultaneous concurrent interactions, and that's why Erlang was used. Okay, um, so as I, as you can imagine, like Java was for some other some other purpose, C plus plus was for some other purpose, Objective C was for some other purpose, and Objective C, for example, was used when uh, iPhone came out with its App Store and the entire structure. Objective C was used because Objective C was worked perfectly for the for the hardware uh, uh, for the hardware requirements and the software requirements of uh, the App Store at that time. Then it was a new language was created, which was Swift. Uh, which was based on similar, which sounded or looked similar to JavaScript, uh, which looked and uh, which looks and reads or has a syntax similar to JavaScript, but essentially it's an abstracted form of Objective C, uh, uh, and it's much easier to use. So, what's a tech stack? You must have heard of that also a lot of times. So, tech stack is basically. Uh, uh, is basically a, a, a bundle of multiple technologies, multiple languages, multiple frameworks, which put together create the front end and the back end. Typically, it's also called front end stack and back end stack. Or else, if you just it, if you just simply say tech stack, it's typically um, you know, seen in the form of um, back end stack. Like that's the that's a typical thing that people understand. Okay, so. In the back end, what else, what's the stack? What are the components of the stack? You'll talk about the operating system, you'll talk about the web server, you'll talk about the database, you'll talk about the web programming language, and a web framework. Okay, so let me give you some examples here. So, operating system, well, most of the internet works on Linux. Okay, now Linux itself has multiple flavors. So right from Ubuntu to Red Hat to uh, Suze to so many uh, to uh, Gentoo, there's so many so many of them, right? Uh, so operating system is the one on which you you will install the servers and database. Essentially, all of these web servers, databases, etc., are also softwares, right? So you'll be installing them basis the operating system that is available on the server side. Okay, so there are Apple or Mac based servers also. There, there are Windows based servers also uh, called IIS, and there are Linux based servers also. Linux based servers are usually the most common one is Ubuntu, but a lot of purists actually prefer to use uh, uh, SUSE or they just make their own Linux versions. Okay, 
So on this Linux version, you would install something like Apache as a web server. Uh, nowadays, there's another uh, server which is which is getting very popular, and that is called Nginx. But then there are multiple others. But Apache and Nginx are, I would say, the top, um, the most popular web servers. Then comes database. Now databases are again uh, a whole bunch of databases exist. Postgre, uh, Postgre is there. MySQL is there. NoSQL is there. MongoDB is there. Uh, there. There are a huge number of databases that exist. From the paid ones to the free ones, that is open source as well as proprietary ones. Um, within the databases, there are two buckets. Uh, one is relational databases like MySQL, like I explained. Uh, think of uh, MySQL as an Excel sheet, a very large, complicated Excel sheet. And non relational databases like MongoDB, NoSQL, and so on, which you can think of them as. Um, uh, as lists nothing else they, they are essentially just there's no column there's only rows if you just have rows uh, if you strip off an excel sheet with the columns what you get you just get rows you still have cells you still have uh, key value pairs so as soon as you strip off the columns essentially what you start getting is key value pairs okay so multiple key value pairs are stored in a certain list that is all this is the no, the non relation database so relation database and non-relation database, they have their own pros and cons. Uh, relation databases are much easier to uh, process and index and search from. But then again, it has a lot of redundancy involved because uh, uh, not all the databases, not all the data points or rows require all the column values. So a lot of column values will also be empty, right? There are numerous other reasons, but uh, just, just talking about high level. So as against that, the non-relation databases, you will only have specific key value pairs of only those values which exist, right? So you'll not, you don't have to create frameworks and structure. Uh, in relation databases, you have to do a lot of uh, pre-planning before you create the database. So if you make any change, if you want to change the column after like two months of uh, building out the application because you realize that the columns need to change or the, the rows need to change or I, I need to add another column or whatever, um, because you forgot to add another information or you forgot to you know store some other information uh, it's it's a it's a lot of work okay it's a lot of work because for one particular row you have to have another cell so just for that reason a whole a new column will be added and uh, all the other cells will all the other rows will be empty but except for one row sheer wastage plus this entire thing will also disrupt or disturb the entire application as well because uh, the entire application needs to know the new column, etc. Et it's a lot of work. While in a non relation database, because just key value pair, you can just simply add one more key value to that particular row. Other rows don't care, don't know, and no need to know. Right? So, this is the like pros and cons. So, they work beautifully for certain use cases, they don't work so beautifully for different use cases. Uh, and we will come to that when you start actually working on your own project, right? Then comes the programming language, which was the PHP, Python, Ruby, etc. This is where the programming language comes in. This is also the application layer. So the application is designed in which language? Is it Python? Is it Ruby? Is it what? And then comes the web framework. So typically, so you can always write without using any framework. You can just create a Python application without using any framework or PHP uh, uh, application without using any framework. The frameworks were designed because a lot of the uh, work required or a lot of work was repetitive. For example, you have to create a sign in sign up process, you have to create a, a, a checkout process, you have to create certain things which are very, very common. Okay, I'm just giving very high level, but actually, there are a lot of things that go behind the scene. So the frameworks allowed think of the framework as a template that the template already exists and you just have to simply use it as is use it as is right so for example the php got a framework called uh, zend it also has a numerous other zend is one of the most popular most heavy and i personally hate it but uh, it's one of the most popular frameworks uh, and python has something called django uh, ruby is something uh, ruby has something called uh, rails 
So Ruby on Rails is what you would have heard. So Ruby is a language and Rails is a framework. Then Python has Django. Again, there are multiple other frameworks that exist, but these are the ones which are most popular, most common. So this is all about the server side. The, uh, the server side you must have heard of, or if you have not heard of, there will be two tech stacks which will be very commonly used. The uh, one is LAMP and other is MEAN. So LAMP is L-A-M-P. L stands for Linux. Okay, so that is the operating system here. A stands for Apache, which is a web server here. M stands for MySQL, that is database here. P stands for Python. Okay, framework is usually not mentioned when you talk about the stack. You'll simply say LAMP. And you have not even mentioned Ubuntu or Red uh, Red Hat or whatever. So you just, you just said that yeah, it's a LAMP uh, tech stack that is Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. And MEAN, MEAN stands for, M stands for Mongo, so the non relation database. E stands for Express, which is web framework. A stands for Angular. Okay, Angular is the front end, is a front end language, we'll come to that. And N stands for Node, which is a programming language, the application, right? So mean is a, is a term which got very popular, um, which as you can see, as compared to LAMP, it, it doesn't mention anything about uh, uh, the operating system, it doesn't mention anything about uh, the web server as such, because Node, Node itself is a server, Node also works as a server by itself. But people initially used to use Node for the server requirement as well. But soon after, there were other, uh, like Apache and Nginx came into being, and uh, Node started working just as a programming language. Uh, but yeah, different people use it in different fashion. This is good to know. So why is uh, all this information important as a product manager? Well, it is important because uh, you need to know, see, the, the decision of what stacks to be used and which languages to be used are with the developer. Okay. You're not supposed to step on their toes. But knowing this will help you discuss the requirements and discuss them uh, properly with the developer much easier. Okay. So for example, you can, because you know this, now you can actually start thinking about the requirements of your app. You can actually say that uh, my app is expecting, I'm expecting a lot of read writes. So you just make sure that the language that you're using, it has that read write cap capability. My application needs to process the information without multiple loads, without multiple page loads. So please make sure that you have included that infrastructure now that might mean some language that might mean some uh, special kind of uh, framework that might mean some special kind of coding you don't know and you don't have to know but it's your responsibility to know the factors that are being governed by the choice of the tech stack right so you can do all this research and you can help out the developers you can help out uh, help them out but end of the day they will be responsible for taking the call okay? so for example um, uh, for example the developer might be very excited about some new age language that has come in okay it is very excited about using it okay for example react react is a front-end uh, uh, framework and uh, language that has come in popularized by Facebook so Angular was the was the go-to baby for everyone, for all the developers. Then React came in and everybody wanted to use React. So just like Ruby, PHP was there, then Ruby came in, then Python again caught back its uh, uh, the interest and so on, right? So the, the developers would want to switch very quickly. They would want to use the latest and the greatest, which is fine. But you as a product manager has to bring the sanity, has to bring in the uh, the logic that hey, React is all cool, but do we really need to use it? Because, uh, or even if you should use it, but do we have the resources to use it? You are the only person who, for example, you are the only developer who understand and who can build out React, but 
uh, if we actually end up building our building our entire product on react we also need more people to scale up this uh, product and those other people are might not be available in your local geography or even if they are available they're not so good right so in that case you are the person who has to bring in this kind of discussion uh, discussions while deciding a tech stack that do we have the resources do we have the resources scalably can we get more people in the future how costly will it be to actually bring in the people in future versus training them in house right and so many other decisions so this is where you can have those kind of discussions properly only if you understand what's happening in the back end right so the the database choices the web server choices the the, the programming language choices etc depending on how technical your product is you can expect more very technical people also be involved on the developer side so you, they might have taken this the, the call for example if you were the product manager at whatsapp and you were joined you joined after let's say 8 months 1 year right and you're like what is this language erlang i've never heard of it and you would want to know what's the logic behind it and then you might have to get hold of some, some developer one at least one developer to explain to you that why was erlang chosen and you need to know that information because that will help you in designing better products right so you might be there you might not be there if you are not there just make sure that you understand the logic the reasoning behind the stack that was chosen okay was it chosen simply because that was a uh, because that was a best language best stack for the particular job or uh, uh, was it simply because that's the only language that's the only stack our developers and our team knew right so that is the importance that uh, importance of learning all of these things just to give you a quick like i said lamp is uh, is one of the most popular backend stacks uh, a wordpress which pretty much runs uh, uh, i don't know majority of the internet uh, runs on lamp uh, you can use any linux uh, flavor it runs beautifully on any kind of lamp flavor uh so framework like I was explain, explaining express is uh, a framework for node laravel uh, zend is for php dot net is for c uh, objective c uh, django is for python so these are the frameworks that exist on the front end the components of are these so html css javascript are for web okay objective c and swift for ios or android apps so objective c and swift are used for ios uh actually objective c is also used for android um uh, and uh, java is also used for ios or android app depending on what you're building uh, so there are certain hybrid apps also that you can build and they use a mixture of uh, objective c and java uh so front end frameworks are not always required but nowadays they are re recommended because the space at which you have to move is has increased a lot so if you're not using frameworks you're going to you're going to take a lot of time to build anything meaningful okay so javascript frameworks are like angular is very popular backbone is very popular react is very popular ember is very popular each one of them have their own uh, pros and cons and it's too much to actually cover in a uh, slide i mean each one of them are separate courses in themselves but to give you a basic gist uh, angular was popularized by google react was popularized by facebook so these are the two big sponsors of these two languages okay uh, right now react is the flavor of the season a lot of people are using react uh, a lot of people are using angular continuously because they jumped on the angular bandwagon much earlier so now they are looking to switch to react just because to stay cool but uh, you know and this sort of decisions are also a lot of lot of times taken purely to you know uh, attract good developers because good developers also always want to build uh, on the latest and the greatest so attracting developers to build something which was built which was coded on php is actually very tough for example so you would want the latest and greatest and then there are uh, some presentation frameworks which are like bootstrap is one of them yahoo has another one of them there's plenty of them so these presentation frameworks are essentially uh, you can think of them as uh, an html and css framework so it allows you to create websites very quickly you don't have to code the button again you don't have to code the uh the hero section again you don't have to create sections you don't have to create cards the the usual the usual interaction the usual uh, 
uh, elements of any interface, you don't have to create them again from scratch because Bootstrap and similar presentation frameworks are already uh, are already taking care of them. Okay. So you need to know what's uh, uh, at least learn about Angular and React. When I say learn about, you just know that these are frameworks which have a lot of these. Just like I said about presentation frameworks, a lot of elements that you can look and feel are already pre-coded predefined similarly in angular and react a lot of things which you would have to spend time to actually code and design so for example if there's an update in one button the all the other buttons should be automatically updated such kind of things are possible in angular and uh, react very easily and so people prefer to use them but as a product manager uh, let me just tell you one quick thing that there's no dearth of Especially now, there is no dearth of JavaScript frameworks, presentation frameworks, uh, jQuery, and a whole bunch of JavaScript codes. And uh, developers, because they also have to move very fast, they choose to abandon. Abandon. Uh, I'm sorry. They use they, they, they use it very frequently. Okay, they use a lot of them and too much of them. Okay, which leads to the page gets heavier and heavier and heavier because it's a lot of junk. When you add a simple query or a plugin, uh, JavaScript plugin to your uh, to your front end, you might just need one function that this plugin has. But because you added the entire plugin, you essentially have added the entire thali or the entire buffet, okay? Uh, which basically is a lot of junk, and that leads to additional kilobytes, and the page starts getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Okay. As a product manager, that's something that you have to control. You have to control the size, the latency, and you have to describe the latencies that you are okay with that you need to provide to your client. And you have to be extremely brutal about that, right? Because you are responsible for the client experience. The developer might say that if you don't you will allow me to use this package, it's going to take me one week. It's your call. You have to take a call that, yeah, it's okay. Don't use this package because it's adding another 15 kilobyte to my page load. I can't handle it. I cannot afford it. Please code it yourself. Okay. Depending on what the situation is, you might have to take such calls. Okay. So to conclude, in this session, we understood what's front end, what's back back end, what's the tech stacks, and what what constitutes the tech stacks. There are plenty of frameworks that exist, uh, and you have to be very conscious if you are at. If you're in the decision making, uh, if you were participating in that decision, um, you have to be very conscious of the load times of certain, certain frameworks because certain frameworks are actually very, very heavy. You have to talk about the different packages, different uh, uh, you know, benefits of different frameworks and scalability of different frameworks. Uh, how much, how advanced and how quickly are people adopting to it? How, uh, how many plugins and how many uh, support? How quick is the support? How active is the community, etc., etc. You will take care of all of that because a lot of times developers might get swayed in and they would want to work on the like latest and the greatest, but might not be the best for your use case. Okay, so you have to bring in that sanity in your uh, company. That's all for now. Thank you.